it's really important that we understand the full picture, the toll of gun violence, of firearm injury in this country. It's not just the mass shootings that show up on TV, and it's not just the school shootings that we are understandably concerned about. We are not talking enough about firearm suicide, and we are not talking enough about the daily violence that's happening all around us. I think that's where physicians can make a difference. Physicians need to be talking about firearm safety and storage. What does it mean to store it safely? What are the steps to take? We're not talking about asking every single person who comes in for any reason whether they have guns at home. But we do know there are certain situations where a person is at increased risk of having a bad outcome if they have access to firearms. If you don't have firearms, then you need to know how to have the conversation because if you're not comfortable having the conversation, then will you? And if you're not gonna have the conversation, you're missing an opportunity to promote safety. And really, this is what this is 100% about. So in general, there are two different types of firearms. There's your long guns and then like your short guns or your handguns. This one is a type of shotgun, which is a pump action. And then this is a rifle and this is a semi-automatic rifle right here. The method of storage that is most likely to protect people from injuries and deaths is unloaded and locked with the ammunition stored separately. How you use a safety device like a cable lock, it will go up the grip and it will come out the ejection port here and you will just thread it through and then you will connect it into the open port on your cable lock. Other different types of safety devices include safes. Some of them come with like a key lock on them and then other ones um, come, like this one has a keypad that you can use. Other ones will use um, like a biometric device where you can use your fingerprint to allow quick access. Other devices include trigger locks, the lock that goes around the trigger here so that the trigger cannot be depressed. What you say, depends a lot on their motivation, what their life experience is, what their family culture is. If you aren't being sensitive to that, I think there's not a great reason to think that you would be effective in your communication. She's a good puppy. I grew up hunting. That is a part of my history, part of my culture and heritage. <laughs> you have the recreational, fun, sporting side of it but you also have the self-defense aspect of it. The majority of my customers that come to me are looking for the self-defense side. Honestly, I thought I needed to be safe, and the firearm made me feel like I was safe. It wasn't like I felt like I needed a thing, but like it was like being around people who think they need it, they make you feel like you need it. The firearm being close by sometimes, it make you feel a little better. Safe firearm storage is paramount. The average person is going to think that the, the nightstand drawer is perfectly fine, a pile in the closet, things of that nature is perfectly fine. And it's just not. And they don't know this unless you share that with them. They have something like the loaded firearm that's in a nightstand. That is the most dangerous firearm to them in the home because it's not secured. Especially if they have someone like a child that's in their home or visiting their home. You want to start moving them to secure storage. In this particular story that a colleague told me, there was a negotiation in which the conclusion was, could you store the firearm safely during the day while your young son is running around? And if you feel at night that you really need it in that bedside drawer, obviously, you know, we, we share our recommendations around that, but at the very least, when he's awake, running around, can it be stored in the way that we just described? They may not be able to get all the way to perfect, which is stored, unloaded, locked with the ammunition separate from the firearm. But we might be able to get them to say, hey, are you willing to do something like this? Where we can take this loaded firearm and put it in a safe. And then the next time they come in, I'll ask them, how is this locked firearm doing for you? Have you had to access it? No, well, if you thought about maybe now storing it unloaded, start slowly moving them down the road. There are no state or federal laws that prevent us from talking to our patients, from asking our patients about firearms at home. And there have been studies showing that the vast majority of firearm owners are open to counseling about firearms when it's appropriate to the situation. 
people with elevated suicide risk, kids in the home, cognitive impairment, particularly in the context of dementia, intimate partner violence. And then the last one is community violence or youth who live in spaces where there's a lot of violence. When we look at gun deaths in this country, about 60% are from suicide. There's good evidence that we could save a lot of people if firearms were not the primary method by which people attempted suicide. There are really three facts that are important to know. The first is that most suicide attempts happen within a pretty short time period. From the moment of deciding to take action to actually acting can be in the space of minutes to hours maybe. The second thing is that when someone attempts suicide with a gun, about 90% of the time they'll die. And then the third key fact is that suicide is not inevitable. Among those who attempt and then survive suicide, 90% don't later die by suicide. People say, well, if they don't have the gun, they'll just take medications, they'll do something else. Okay, like some may, but if they try something else, chances are they're gonna make it to a hospital and get help. I saw a patient who came in with his mom. He was like a young adult. First, he just told me he felt like he was drinking too much and was anxious, and then she was sort of nudging him, like, say what's really going on, and it turned out he was really stressed out from work um, and having some suicidal thoughts. First of all, I normalized him coming in. Lots of people go through rough times and then get better. I asked him, what are you looking forward to, to get a sense of how depressed or suicidal he was. And then I said to him, while you're getting better, it's safest if you don't have access to firearms, because if you had a bad night and you felt like you couldn't take it and you reach for a gun, you're probably not gonna survive. Then we had our behavioral health therapist come talk to him and, and figure out the next steps. Yes, they still need their therapy appointment. Yes, we still need access to mental health resources. But I think it's important as, as clinicians, we recognize that conversation with them, with their family about locking up firearms at home or moving them out of the home, that may make the difference between life and death. If there's a person who shouldn't have access to firearms for a period of time, there are a couple options. In the home, that could mean changing the passcode on the lockbox, moving the ammunition out of the house, Outside of the home, there are programs that store them with local gun shops. You can store them with an appropriate family member or friend. Depends a little bit state to state in terms of what your options are. Often firearm owners themselves know all of these rules. And you can talk with families about what options might work for them. Firearm deaths are the leading cause of death for adolescents and children. In pediatric care, I think that it's important to universally screen, give as many families the tools as possible. Secure firearm storage counseling can be integrated into your clinical practice very quickly. For me, I can incorporate it into a well child check in under a minute. In pediatrics in particular, it really makes sense to bundle some of these topics together. So it's not do you have a pool and do you have a gun? Okay, let's talk about that. It might be, let's talk about pool safety, whether it's your home or the neighbor's house. And let's talk about firearm access, whether it's your house or the neighbor's house. Once you continue to do it and get comfortable doing it, it's gonna feel incredibly effective. In pediatric care, we give this guidance to every patient because we don't know what we don't know. For example, I have a colleague who is in law enforcement remembers to this day, I believe his daughter has grown now, having a conversation with a physician about whether there was a firearm in the home, and of course there was, and he had not thought about safe storage, hadn't thought about the fact that his daughter was a child and that her processing and how she understood risk was different. That conversation stopped him in his tracks. There's also this idea of a teachable moment, somebody being more open to a conversation because of something that just happened. Maybe there's a minor injury, a kid fell down the stairs and hurt their leg and they're gonna be fine, but that's an opportunity to talk about home safety with the parents and say, you know what, kiddo's exploring more, let's think about other safety hazards. Parents really want their child to be safe. That's their driving motivation. We also want children to be safe. So establishing that shared goal 
and value at the beginning goes really, really far. Numbers-wise, dementia is not the leading issue in firearm injury or death, but for families who are dealing with it, it's incredibly difficult and is a very significant risk. I think the conversation is really about planning ahead, engaging the older adult themselves in making their own decisions. As dementia progresses, really they shouldn't be having any access to firearms. And I think it's about giving families specific guidance about either where they can take firearms if they want to sell them or get rid of them, what they can do to make things safer at home. One of the areas we don't spend nearly enough time thinking or talking about is intimate partner violence. We know that the presence of a gun in that relationship significantly increases the risk of death for the victim, even when it's the victim's gun. If you're caring for someone who is involved in domestic violence and there's a firearm, I do think it's reasonable to express to them that that elevates concern even more. As physicians, we can be a supportive place and help guide people. So it might mean in some clinical practices, making sure that we have someone who is specially trained in working with domestic violence victims. And the firearm is a piece of that conversation. Community violence is in many ways a symptom of structural violence or structural racism and systems that are built so that some communities are well invested in and some communities are not. Sometimes physicians can feel a little bit powerless, but I do think that in places where there's a focus on community violence, safe storage is an underutilized tool. We spend a lot of effort trying to stop the influx of new guns. And I think that that makes a great deal of sense, but there are a lot of guns already on the street. If we don't do anything to make sure that the ones that are just out there are safely stored, we're just missing an opportunity. I think the first step is who are the community partners doing work in my backyard? There was a community program that we were working with in Philadelphia. They were already distributing gun locks. A lot of the young people that we serve carry guns. It's an important thing that we do is meeting young people where they are. How do we make sure that they lock them up properly? How do we make sure that they're not hurting themselves and hurting other people? We give out cable locks and then we surveyed the community and we upgraded to gun safes because that's what the community said that they wanted. We've created a culture of trust. When you're here, you're safe. So if you're bringing a good gun here with you to the hangout space, you have to lock it up and get it back before you leave. There is an opportunity to underscore our message and tap into credible messengers. Having someone who has experienced some of those types of violence comment on safe storage, you can just imagine how powerful that would be. Yeah, it fully gave me more lock boxes than I can count. I have siblings, so I definitely wanted to keep my siblings protected at the same time while keeping me protected. When you can impact the health of a community, now you're impacting thousands of lives. We can only do so much within the clinical walls, and we really do need to be out into the community spaces. And that's where we can make the biggest impact on health. I'm not an expert marksman. I'm not a current gun owner, but over the years I've learned enough so that I feel like I can have the kind of conversations I want to have with patients. And I think that's the starting point. Um, don't be intimidated. <laughs>